Hello, everyone. This is Ben Kelly with the Endeavoring Orthodoxy podcast. Today, I've got a short little bonus episode for you. Um, I've entitled, I've written an essay that I entitled Why God. I wrote it for school. I'm currently in the last semester of my postgraduate program, and I'm taking the Doctrine of God as one of my last classes. And we had to this week write a short essay. It's uh, barely 600 words, so not long at all. But write a short essay reflecting on why God. So I'm going to read this essay to you and talk a little bit about what I'm getting at with the essay. So before I do that, if um, you're listening to this and you like the content, uh, please remember to like and subscribe. Uh, When you do that, it helps me grow this channel so that I know I'm doing the right thing, and I'm getting out good content for you that you want to see more of and hear more of. So the essay I am looking at and I'm reading today, Why God? And really, the prompt for this essay was really to talk about, we, we read a book called America's Four Gods. It was by a couple authors named Paul Fruese. I, I think that's how you say his name, um, F-R-O-E-S-E. Froese, Froese, I'm, I'm, I'm calling him Froese, and Christopher Bader, uh, they wrote a book, it's a few years old, um, America's Four Gods, they really look at the different beliefs in America about God and the character and how we, how much our beliefs in God really dictate our entire worldview, and so my topic or my kind of prompt for writing this essay was look at this book. I read this book in the last couple of days. Take the, the whole text and really talk about what's important with the church and why we need to kind of come back to this idea of why God, where we need to nail down our, our conception, our, our theological understanding of God, because we're, we're in such uh, a culture that is full of turmoil and culture wars right now where people believe kind of wherever they want. And um, it really, a lot of it has to do with their misconception of God. So I'm going to read this essay. It won't take long, but I'll explain what I'm trying to do here. And I'll explain, you know, really uh, how I'm going to try to continue this kind of thinking, uh, maybe for later projects, but it's entitled Why God? Reads, in their book, America's Four Gods, Paul Freus and Christopher Bader describe how the way people conceive of God has a great influence on many other aspects of their lives. In fact, these authors state that the way people answer two questions concerning God reveal enormous in- insight into people's worldviews. The two questions are, to what extent does God interact with the world, and to what extent does God judge the world? Much can be known about a person based on his answers to those two questions. A similar idea is echoed by Gerald Bray in his book, The Doctrine of God. Bray states that many people often believe in the existence of God, but when it comes to deciding the finer points of the character of God, people have wildly differing opinions. It can be implied from these observations that differing worldviews of people in America today are primarily fueled by differing conceptions of the nature of God. This implication fuels focus on worldview analysis in the realm of Christian apologetics and philosophy. Christian philosopher Ronald Nash argues that understanding a person's worldview is one of the best tools that can be utilized in the practices of apologetics and evangelism. Theology, or a person's beliefs about God, is at the top of the list on what a Christian must understand to interact with a non-believer's worldview. Nash presents four other areas that Christians ought to understand when interacting with worldview of other people. Metaphysics, which are beliefs about ultimate reality. Epistemology, beliefs about knowledge. Ethics, beliefs about morality. And anthropology, beliefs about human nature. However, given the observations by Freus, Bader, and Bray, 
one can make the case that all four other major areas of a worldview that Nash describes are largely dominated by a person's understanding of the nature of God. They are dominated by a person's theology. This realization can have benefits and impact on the church and its mission. For example, when Jesus tells his own disciples to go and make disciples, Matthew 28, 19, there should already be a contextual understanding for Christians in contemporary American culture that this process is going to involve a level of unpacking a person's worldview, primarily views on the nature of God. In fact, given this line of thinking, the Christian apologetic and mission of the church is built on the foundation of understanding who God is and what he has done for his people. There is no doubt that the American culture routinely approves and celebrates ideas and practices that the Christian church has long believed to be sinful. Yet, much of the response from the church to this sinfulness has been to focus on the sin. The question should be asked if this response is appropriate or set for failure because it only focuses on the symptom of a greater issue. If the observations of the earlier authors are to be believed, then issues of sinful morality are not at their root simply issues of persons choosing sin, but misconceptions of the true nature and person of God. If the church truly wanted to attack the sinful moral practices of the culture, then it ought to focus more on addressing non-biblical conceptions of God. Jesus routinely did this. He often taught the common and uneducated people of his day about God, the nature of salvation, and the kingdom of heaven. He focused on a loving and just God. Jesus taught how God sought to reconcile a people who were dead in sin, but would be made alive through the work of the Messiah. Jesus could do this because he was the direct revelation and true image of God. He is the word of God and how people know God. The church can challenge the cultural conception of God by making God known through his word. So that is the essay that I wrote. I told you it was very brief. It, I had a very small word limit on it to where I had to explain that I understood the material that was in there and really get into the content uh, very quickly. It was really more of a reaction and reflection of what I would do. But that is the question really to, to be asked. You know, I've, I've studied Christian apologetics. I, I know how to respond to people who are non-believers who have objections to faith. And this idea, this, this conception of God, where we have to really focus on understanding who God is, I, I think this is the way that we have to move in our theology, in our in our evangelism, in our mission, you know, in our apologetics. We can't focus on all these periphery problems. You know, just like I said in the essay, if we focus on sin, we're we're not necessarily attacking the root of the problem. And and that as um Fruace and Bader said in their book, you can usually tell a lot about a person's worldview just based on two questions about what they think about God. And so that really begs the question then, you know, why do we spend so much time focusing on all this other stuff? For example, there are, there's a lot being said right now about, you know, different challenges with the culture's view of, of gender and sexuality. And I am not afraid to say I'm a complementarian when it comes to those issues. You know, I believe that in the home and in the church, there are biblical roles for men and women that uh, one is not better than the other. Uh, they are equal in worth and dignity, but they have different roles. But we've had this idea kind of confused in the culture. We've had this idea very much, even, even those who aren't complementarians, who are more egalitarian, uh, our culture has said things about the role of gender and sexuality that uh, even good um, Bible-believing egalitarians couldn't um, get on board with. And so, but the idea is that we spend so much time attacking those issues. 
talking about an issue like that, you know, I can't tell you how many just little ministries there are of biblical masculinity and how many guys who can't write very well and they have, you know, less schooling than I do and are writing books on biblical masculinity. And that's fine. We can write biblical theology like that. And that's, that's good to a certain extent, but I would argue that we suffer so much as the church because we are not centrally focused on understanding who God is and what he wants for his people. So I, I would I told you this was going to be a short episode. I didn't want to make it long. I'm going to leave it at that. But that's something to think about. You know, are we going to spend a lot of time getting really off track with all these other issues? Are we going to focus on the big problem where if we attack this idea of who is God, what does he want for his people, how does he judge his people, if we're really going to attack understanding the character and the nature of God, well, that could, that could change so much. If a person's conception of God really dictates most of their worldview, and we work to help people understand the correct view of who God is and what he wants, that, that changes everything. So I'll leave you with that. Uh, again, if you like the content, please like and subscribe. I've got a lot of things in the works. I'm trying to get it up as best I can. Unfortunately, I'm doing a, a lot of reading and writing for school right now, so I don't have as much time to put into the channel. But come end of December, beginning of January, there will be a lot more. So uh, God bless you all. Love you all and hope to see you soon again.